Hey guys, welcome back. Um, we're still in chapter three, meiosis development and aging. Although now we are moving on to section four, which deals with prenatal development. Now again, we're not gonna go into super detail. We're just trying to give you the gist of this, but we are still gonna talk on a little bit of everything. So hopefully you guys are ready. All right, <clears throat> let's get started. So first thing we have to talk about is fertilization. And that is when the egg and the sperm fuse together. So a sperm cell can actually survive up to three days within the woman's body. However, the oocyte is pretty short lived in terms of when it can be fertilized. It can only be fertilized up to 12 to 24 hours after it has been ovulated. So ovulation occurs, you have at upwards of 24 hours to be fertilized, Other, uh, otherwise fertilization will not occur. Now, as we mentioned previously, the ovaries alternate which one ovulates. So how do the sperm know which fallopian tube to go up? Well, it's actually pretty interesting. The oocyte will give off a chemical attractant. <clears throat> so it gives off a chemical signature that the sperm are attracted to, kind of like magnets. And that's going to cause the majority of the sperm to go up the correct fallopian tube to have the greater chance of fertilization. As the sperm meet up with the egg, remember the egg has a protective layer of cells around it, but each sperm has an acrosome on its head, which is a coating of enzymes. And every time the sperm makes contact with that protective layer of cells, some enzymes are released and they start eating away through the oocytes protective cells. And you have all the sperm kind of bouncing around it all at once. And eventually, someone will make it all the way through the protective layer into the cell. When that occurs, the sperm is actually only going to fuse its head with the egg. <clears throat> its midpiece and its tail, they fall off, and it is just the head where the nucleuses or the pronuclei is that will enter the egg. Once this has occurred, the oocyte will actually tri trigger certain changes to occur to its surface, chemical and electrical changes that will prevent any other sperm from being able to penetrate and fuse with the egg as well. This way, <clears throat> you don't have to worry about having too many chromosomes if a third sperm fuses as well. Because remember, the egg and the sperm, they're gametes. They each have half of the genetic material. So the sperm has 23 chromosomes, the egg has 23 chromosomes. When they fuse together, you now have 23 pairs of chromosomes or 46 total chromosomes. So you don't want another sperm getting in there. After the head of the sperm has fused, the pronuclei, which is the nucleus of the sperm that has half the genetic material, is going to be released and is going to move through the cytoplasm of the egg and merge, actually fuse, with the pronuclei of the egg. So now you have the meeting, the com combining of the genetic material. And at this point, we now say we have a zygote, which is a single fertilized cell. So this is what we're talking about. Here is the egg, got the protective layer. The sperm arise or arrive to it. They start hitting it every time they do. They release the acrosome, which eats through this protective layer until eventually one cell, one sperm, can get in. Once it, the head of that sperm fuses, the midpiece and tail will fall off 
and the egg will create chemical and electrical changes along the surface that's going to prevent any of these other sperm from fusing with it. The pronuclei is released from the sperm. Here's a pronuclei from the uh, egg. They combine, they fuse, we now have a diploid nucleus and we now have a zygote. Now you might notice this little dot right here, that's the last polar body. <clears throat> All right, let's talk a little bit about some of the early events. Again, we're just kind of going through this. We're not gonna get into too much detail. So we have our zygote, which is a single fertilized egg. And what's gonna happen is it's going to start going through division, but not right away, because it does take some time for the two pronuclei to meet and fuse. But usually about a day after fertilization, it's gonna start going through mitosis. And it's gonna keep going and going and going. And it's just gonna go through these rapid successions of mitosis to get more and more and more cells. After a while, goes through this process called cleavage and it's going to form a hollow ball of cells. So instead of having just like one big clump of cells, it starts reorient, reorientating itself to a blastocyst, which is the hollow ball of cells. Now by this time, it has finished making its way through the fallopian tube and is now in the uterus and can implant into the endometrium, the uterine lining. The outermost layer of cells on the blastocyst, um, the trophoblast, they secrete HCG. This is the essentially the pregnancy hormone. The presence of this hormone in the woman's body is going to prevent menstruation because you don't want to get rid of the endometrium lining if there is a fertilized egg attached to it. So it's going to halt and prevent any menstrual cycles from occurring. And this is also the indicator hormone that lets a woman know if she's pregnant. When the um, pregnancy tests, the ones that you pee on, excess of this hormone gets filtered out through the kidneys and passed out through the urine, which is why when it reaches a certain level that is common in pregnancy, it is, can be indicated and read or measured by that pregnancy test. All right, so here we have our zygote. It's going through mitotic divisions and what we call cleavage. It's just forming all these many, 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 many cells. And then the blastula, here we have on the inside, is all the cells kind of wrote orientate themselves to the outside and leaves this hollow cavity, which the blastocele. Then the next part is gastrulation, which is when it starts folding inward. So you have this ball of cells and then it starts bending inward on itself. And that's gonna start forming different layers. Where'd my thing go? There we go. Sorry, I have a cough drop in. So now this is looking at it in terms of fertilization and implantation. <clears throat> so here's the ovary. The egg got ovulated. Notice that the sperm fertilize it pretty high up in the fallopian tube. So the sperm were deposited in the vagina. They still have to swim up through the, the cervix, through the uterus. They are attracted towards one of the fallopian tubes. They're gonna swim all the way up through the fallopian tubes until they meet the egg. Then they're all gonna surround the egg and start bumping into it. And as they do that, the acrosome, it releases that enzyme, it breaks down that protective layer until one nucleus, one sperm, sorry, can actually penetrate the cell membrane and fuse. 
<clears throat> Again, it's only the head of the sperm, not the midpiece or the tail. Its genetic material will combine with the genetic material of the egg, producing a diploid nucleus, and that's when we start calling it the zygote. So it's going to start going through divisions. So we can see 30 hours after fertilization, so that was at hour zero, 30 hours, and we took one cell divided into two. Then two becomes four, four becomes eight, eight becomes 16, 16 becomes 32, and so on and so on and so on. Now it doesn't actually leave the fallopian tube until around 72 hours after fertilization. Then we have the blastocyst, that's the hollow ball of cells, and it's going to implant right into the lining. That usually takes us to six days past the um, past fertilization. It's also around the time that it's going to start producing that HCG hormone. It will take still a little bit more time for the levels to build up and to pass from mom through her kidneys and not through the urine in terms of a readable amount. All right. The embryo forms. During week two of pregnancy, the amniotic cavity is going to form. Now within this amniotic cavity, we notice the formation of the primitive germ layer. So these are the three layers of cells that will eventually become specific tissues and organs. So we have the ectoderm, the endoderm, and the mesoderm. So that's it, week two. During week three, the primitive streak forms. And this is going to, pretty much what happens is the embryo is flattened out and it'll start um, indenting itself in the middle. That's what the primitive streak is. This is then going to be followed by the development of the central nervous system, the heart, the notochord, the neurotube, and, that, and all that is going to be around the um, primitive streak, which is then going to lead to limbs, digits, you know, your fingers and toes, and facial features. By week eight, all organs have begun, begun to develop. Since all organs have started to form, we stop calling it an embryo and we start calling it a fetus at this point. Now, it doesn't mean that all of the organs are formed. What we're saying is by week eight, cells have been specialized and told that they're gonna become a certain organ. So this cell here told it's gonna become a kidney. So the genes needed to make and function a kidney are turned on, everything else is turned off. So that cell is gonna go through mitotic divisions over and over and over and all those daughter cells are going to be pre-programmed to be kidney cells and they're gonna to stay together and eventually form the kidney. So by week eight, we have differentiated the cells and have started to go through mitotic division with those cells in order to produce organs. They are not made at this point. They are not made, but we have at least told what cells are going to become those organs. So this is kind of looking at early development. So fertilization, cleavage, uh, differentiation, this is day four, day five, six, seven, this is when it implants, um, cell mass. Now this is kind of hard to see. You notice that it has formed a few layers. We have this outside layer and then here and that is showing you where the primitive streak is. I know it's kind of hard to exactly tell on this structure. Because if you notice, <clears throat> you have these outer layers of cells and then this clump of cells in the middle. This outer layer keeps expanding to make this outer part here, which is going to essentially be the sac that everything is in. Because here's the yolk sac, here's the amniotic sac, and this is where it connects with the endometrium. Now this chorion 
again, it's part of the sac. The embryo is just this little tiny piece in there. So even though all of these cells came from that same zygote and the embryo, not all of them actually make the baby. Some of them are making the supportive structures. All right, so here we have, this is a top view of the embryo. This is a side view, you can kind of see how it's flattened out. And here is the primitive streak. Now that's closer to what will be the posterior as opposed to the head. And that primitive streak, it starts pinching inward. And this is what's going to lead to such things as, like we said, the central nervous system. This top layer, that's the ectoderm. The mesoderm is here. And then here we have the endoderm, the primitive germ layers. <clears throat> so again, this is early development, but even this, this is looking at oh, past 20 days. So all of these were made from the same zygote. All of the cells that make every single structure here is made from the zygotes. Here we have the chorion, the chorionic villi, you have the amnion, stalk, yolk sac. Notice it's right here. This is where the embryo is. So again, kind of looking at this part here, but looking at it from the back. <clears throat> this was what began as the um, primitive streak. You see it's now forming the neurotube, the neurofold, Still had the yolk sac, so we're looking at it from this direction. Here again, um, the neurotube has elongated and it's actually going to eventually form the spinal cord, so the actual nerves that go through it. This is going to become the brain up here, and this portion here is going to eventually become the heart. You can notice the yolk sac again right there. And this one is just kind of give you an idea of the different stages of human development. I'm going to move that right up there. So this is what the zygote looks like. That is definitely not to scale. This is a more accurate scale. The egg cell is the largest cell in the human body. So we have day one. The rest of these are mostly to scale, kind of, sort of, not entirely, but a little bit. So we have day one. This is after three days, four days. This is 15 to 17 days. This is 17 to 19 days. 19 to 21, 21 to 23, 23 to 26, 26 to 30. I always thought this was interesting how humans start off with a tail. 28 to 32, doesn't really look that human, does it? 31 to 35. 35 to 38. Now you can kind of start seeing a little bit more. This would have been like this hump here. That's where that neurotube was forming, even here. I know it's a little hard to see where the top, that part would have been, would become the brain. And that little nub right there actually moves down and becomes the heart. So this will become the head. And you can even see here, that circle there and that circle there, those are limb buds. So that's the formation of the limbs. All right, this is 35 to 38. Again, you can see the head, back, that will be a leg, that'll be an arm. 37 to 42, you can start seeing facial features a little more clearly. 42 to 44, arm, leg, you also notice that the tail is disappearing. This dark spot here, that's going to become an eye. <clears throat> you can actually start seeing how the digits are forming within the limbs 
in the eye, you can see the spinal cord. That'll become the ear. You can definitely see the separation of the fingers and a little bit of the toes, eyes. You can see a nose. That's 48 to 51. 51 to 53, ear, eye, hand, arm, elbow, foot. 53 to 54 days, ear, eye. You can see both feet now there. Kind of see both hands overlapping. 54 to 58, and this is the umbilical cord. Mouth, eye, ear, no nose, arm, leg. And this is after 60 days. Now that's only two months. Right? Yeah. So as you can tell, it is definitely not, the baby is not fully developing. It still has to finish its physical development and it still has a lot of the internal development to make as well. Put that back. All right. So let's talk a little bit about supportive structures. You heard me say some of these a little bit previously, but we're gonna go into more detail now. We have something called the chorionic villi, and this will develop during week three. The placenta will actually form by week 10, and this is what connects the woman to the fetus. Now before the placenta forms, it's the chorionic villi that attach and allow for gas exchange between mom and baby and nutrient exchange between mom and baby. But then as the embryo becomes a fetus and it needs, it has greater requirements, the chorionic villi isn't able to supplement as much, which is why it then forms the placenta. <clears throat> the yolk sac and the allantois are what will manufacture blood cells until the bones are formed because if, you're, if you didn't know, it's your bone marrow that makes your red blood cells. Well, at this point, the baby doesn't have bones. So it's the yolk sac and the allantois which will, take, which will cover that job until the bones are created. And you have the umbilical cord. This is what connects the baby to the placenta. There, or they can do something called amniocentesis or chorionic villus sampling if they wanna check the fetal chromosomes. Now what this is, in the chorionic villus sampling, they would actually take like a little needle, go into the uterus, like straight through the belly, into the uterus, and they will take a tissue sample from the chorionic villi. This is, remember, that's made out of baby's cells, so it'll have baby's DNA in it. And the reason why they wanna do that or even the amniocentesis, which is more so for later in development, they just stick the needle into the uterus, into the amniotic sac, and they can take some of that fluid out because baby cells are gonna be swimming throughout all that. They can do this in order to create a karyotype for the baby's chromosomes to see if there are any chromosomal abnormalities to be aware of. This is more common if the mom has had a history of miscarriages, because chromosomal abnormalities are one of the largest contributors to miscarriages or spontaneous abortions. Also, if mom is, has health risks or she's later on in life, they might wanna do a karyotype to, just to make sure, again, that everything is fine with the baby. After the baby is born, sometimes people also keep the umbilical cord because the blood stored within it can be used for bone marrow later in life. So let's say, God forbid, but you develop lymphoma or leukemia and you need a bone marrow transplant. Well, we can't promise that you would get a, an exact match. But the umbilical cord, if, if you still have a preserved sample, a frozen preserved sample of your umbilical cord, the blood in that will be able to be used to create more bone marrow, which will then provide you with an exact match. All right, so 
first two are looking at six weeks. This one's just a close-up view. So this is the uterus on the outside. Here on we have the villi. The chorion is the layer underneath, which is why we call it the chorion and villi. This is the embryo connected to the chorionic villi or chorion by the umbilical cord. The amnion is this light sac around it. And that is the yolk sac. Looking a little closer up again, the amnion or amniotic sac, chorion and chorionic villi, yolk sac. This entire thing is the umbilical cord and within the umbilical cord, that's where the allantois is. Um, this is looking at <clears throat> three months now. Notice that the chorion and the chorionic villi on the outside aren't as prevalent anymore because now the placenta has formed. The villi that connect to the placenta are still there and they've actually branched more. The umbilical cord, the amniotic sac, filled with amniotic fluid, the fetus, and yep, yeah, all right. Just wanna make sure I wasn't missing anything. And diagram two. So this one's looking at the primary germ layers, pretty much, as well as the supportive structures. So let's see. This is the chorion. And you can see the formation of the chorionic villi coming off. This is the amniotic cavity. So the amniotic sac. This is the yolk sac. You'll see how it's much bigger now, but then it kind of shrinks later on, this connecting stalk will eventually become the, uh, sorry, the umbilical cord. This little stuff here, that is the embryo. And on the side closest to the amniotic sac, that's where the ectoderm is located. The middle portion would be the mesoderm and the part or, or the portion closest to the yolk sac, that's the endoderm. All right, the fetus. Starting in month three, the fetus begins to actually resemble a newborn. So as we saw with that picture, that you know, up to two months, 60 days, it was finally starting to look like a human. In month three, it's looking more like a human. So the structures grow, they specialize, we start to have interactions between different body systems. Uh, this is also around the time that the bone is going to start replacing cartilage. So up to this point, we were building a skeletal system, but we were building it out of cartilage, which is a lot softer and more flexible. At this point, we're going to want to start to replace that with the bone cells, so those harder cells. The head is more proportional to the body, so if you remember kind of got like ginormous head, small body, it's going to become more proportional. Now, babies' heads are still pretty big when they're born, and that's just because their skull doesn't do a whole lot of growing after birth. It shifts and it grows a little bit but it doesn't grow as much as the rest of their bones. Sex organs also become pretty distinct at this point. In the final trimester, the fetus grows rapidly and, and it'll actually start moving. So people say you can feel the baby moving. Um, you can sometimes feel it a little bit during the later part of the second trimester, but it's primarily during the final trimester when they're most active and pushing and moving and rotating and all that stuff. Fat is going to start filling out underneath the skin. Yes, we do have fat because it does help to cushion our organs and protect our bodies. So we're going to start creating these fat pockets. The digestive system and the respiratory systems are the very, very last systems to mature, which actually makes sense. Because remember, both of these are being taken care of by mom. The baby is not breathing through its mouth and nose at this point because it's surrounded by fluid. 
there's actually mucus plugs that the doctor will take out after the baby's born. Baby's getting oxygen from mom through the umbilical cord and directly into its blood vessels. And then carbon dioxide is moved from the baby's blood through the umbilical cord to mom and mom gets rid of it. Same with food. That's why they always make the jokes that pregnant women are hungry because they're eating for two. It's not entirely wrong. When mom eats, mom digests, the nutrients and glucose enter her bloodstream. Some of that is gonna go through the umbilical cord and into baby's bloodstream so baby can use those minerals and glucose for energy. And then some of the waste is gonna pass back through mom or through the umbilical cord to mom. Also, as it gets later, baby could also start relieving a little bit of their own waste right in that amniotic sac. And just for size comparison, this is looking at four to 40 weeks. So this is four weeks, eight weeks, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, 32, 36, and 40. You'll notice that this entire back half is primarily just growing. At that point, it's just growing and making sure that the internal organs are, fun are getting set up and functioning. All right, so against the odds, for every 100 secondary oocyte that are exposed to sperm, this is just kind of letting you know how much of a miracle it actually can be. Because remember, we said that a woman is born with all of her eggs, all of her oocytes, and even though she's born with more than a million, only 400,000 of those are. Sorry, 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 not quite sure what happened. All right, so let's get back to presenting. So for every 100 oocytes that are actually exposed to sperm, only about 84 of those 100 are fertilized. For every 84 that are fertilized, only 69 will successfully implant in the endometrium. For every 69 that implant, only 42 will survive one week or longer. For every 42 that survive one week or longer, only 36 will survive six weeks or longer. And out of the 37 that survive six weeks or longer, only 31 are born alive. So you can see that it has this really incredible chances of you know whether or not if it gets fertilized first of all does it actually make it all the way through development this is also kind of showing you a bit of a difference in size between the egg and the sperm because remember we during meiosis we stream all of the excess um, cytoplasm and whatnot all the way into one of the eggs. Yeah. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about multiples now. So multiple meaning multiple births or twins. There are two main types of twins. So the first one is called I are monozygotic twins. You would know them as identical twins. So monozygotic twins Mono meaning one, and then zygotic referring to zygos. So they are two individuals that come from one zygote, which means that one egg got fertilized by one sperm. And then while it's going through the mitotic divisions, it splits. Well, now you have two clumps of cells both genetically identical, and they start going through mitotic divisions, and you end up with two babies. If the our two clumps separate before five days, they will each be able to form their own separate chorion, amniotic sac, and placenta, because by that time, those structures have not started to form. 
if they separate between five to nine days, then the chorion and the placenta would have already started to form. So they will share those structures, but they'll each have their own separate amniotic sac. And if they separate after nine days, they will actually share everything because all of those structures have started to form. We have some cute little examples of identical twins there and there. Awesome. Kind of to talk a little bit about more about how this occurs. So we have one egg fertilized by one sperm. So it starts off as one zygote and one embryo. If it splits before it implants, then you'll notice separate placentas, separate inner sacs, etc. If it implants and then splits, then you'll notice shared placenta, separate internal sacs. And if it implants and splits even later than that, like we said, after nine days, share all the structures. So monozygotic come from one zygote. Those are identical twins. Dizygotic twins are fraternal twins. So this is when you have, instead of one egg being ovulated, two completely separate eggs got ovulated at the same time, and they were each fertilized by their own separate sperm. That's why I, or fraternal twins are not considered the same as identical. Identical twins come from the same egg and sperm, so they are genetically identical to each other. But fraternal twins come from different eggs being fertilized by different sperm. So they are actually genetically unique. They're like regular siblings. They're genetically unique, just like regular siblings, except, except they um, were born at the same time. Sorry. So two eggs are released and are each fertilized by a different sperm, which is why you have these two ladies right here, these young ladies. They are fraternal twins. Both their mom and dad are biracial. And it just so happened that the genes combined in the egg and sperm so that this young lady gets all of the African, um, no, sorry, Jamaican related genes. And this young girl gets all the European genes. So we have this beautiful little darker skin, darker hair girl, and this beautiful little pale skin, lighter hair girl. They have the same mom and dad. They were shared the same uterus at the same time. So they are twins, but they are fraternal twins. That's also how you can have fraternal twins that are different sexes. So we have Again, because they're fertilized by their own separate sperm, the egg that was fertilized by a sperm with an X chromosome became this young lady, and the egg that was fertilized by a sperm that contained a Y chromosome became this young man. All right. So again, this is just showing you two completely separate eggs fertilized by two completely separate sperm, both of them implants, both of them grow. Now we can also talk about conjoined twins, which are Siamese twins. Now the thing about Siamese twins or conjoined twins is they are, first of all, as you can tell, they share tissues and organs. And this occurs when you have monozygotic twins, but instead of the cells completely separating into two balls of cells, as they try and separate, part of them remains interlocked. So they still remain connected. They don't fully separate. And depending on when they separate and what part of them remain connected, that's what will determine the amount of shared organs or tissues. All right, so we have some examples here. These little boys are joined at the top of the head. These young men are actually joined uh, at the front of the torso, so the stomach. We have a few more examples. So here and here, both of these young, or both of these 
conjoined twins. Oh, I couldn't say both these young ladies because technically he has four young ladies, but they share a body, but then they have multiple heads. And actually these young girls here, they also have four arms. These girls though, Ripley, shh, they only have two arms. Um, they are kind of shared on the front of the stomach to the side. So you, there's an arm here, an arm back, and then legs. These two young ladies are sharing at the top side of the head. And here, this is a happy story. We have these two babies. They were joined on the front, kind of like the chest down to the stomach. And they were also able to be successfully separated. Now that can occur all the time. There's no way to separate these two young ladies or these two young ladies or these two or even these two because they share too much of an organ or too much tissue. All right. I'm gonna kind of show you a little bit about what it means in terms of the x-ray, how, so you can see how they're fused. This is like those two young boys we saw where they were fused on the head. Um, these were like the, similar to the two girls, actually the two girls that were on the bottom left that were in the pool. This would be very similar to them. Here they share or they have their own spines, but they share parts of the pelvis fused skull. Um, they have their own torsos, but they share some of the middle organs. And then here, two separate heads, separate spines, but only one torso, which means that all those organs in there are going to be shared. All right, so that completes section four. Um, I know it kind of exited out and got back in. I'm not sure if there was a power surge or what, but worst case scenario, we have part one, part two notes. Otherwise, it's just a long set of notes. Anyways, I hope this was informative. If you have questions, let me know in Google Classroom or through email. And in the meantime, you guys, just stay awesome, stay curious, and most importantly, stay safe and healthy. All right, you guys, take care. Bye-bye.